Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back on behalf of May Hen and myself for this final session of today's Tax Research Network programme. The approximate format for this session is there will be about 45 minutes of talk, followed, we hope, by about 30 minutes of questions and answers. We're delighted to have Professor Irma Mosquera Valderrama from Leiden University as our keynote speaker. As many of you know, Professor Valderrama is a distinguished academic in the allied fields of international tax law and comparative tax law. Uh, in introducing Professor Valderrama, I feel I can do no better than to cite her words in a chapter that she contributed to a 2022 book, Shifting Power Relations in Taxation. Der Gelike führt Welsivar vor Implementatia ist bereicht, ma nicht vor der Betriebsforming und Prozessen betreffende het abstellen van der internationale Belastingsregels. Uh, I don't speak a word of Dutch, but, uh, <laughs> but as I say, I feel that I can do no better than to cite Professor Valderrama, uh, because sycophancy is a great way to get on in life. <laughs> Professor Valderrama's keynote lecture pulls together a number of today's themes by concentrating on global tax governance. As you may know, the term keynote comes from music. The keynote is the first note of the key in which the music is written. So if a piece of music is in the key of C, the first note will be C. It's useful to know this if you're ever performing a piece of music. If you get lost or can't remember your notes, you can always revert safely to the keynote. <laughs> This is advice from the organist who kindly gives up her Thursday evenings to run our shambolic village choir on the edge of Cambridge. We performed our annual summer concert last week. Our last song was the very moving Irish ballad, Danny Boy, which I'm sure some of you know. As we finished, I noticed a lady in the front row of the audience brushing away tears from her eyes. So afterwards, I approached her and asked if she was Irish. No, she replied brusquely, I'm a music teacher. <laughs> because of that incident, I want our guest speaker today to be in no doubt about her audience's feelings. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, please will you give a very, very warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Valderrama. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, also for the invitation to the Tax Research Network and Dominique May for making this possible. And your Dutch is perfect. You're getting there. So, um, my keynote speech of today is to some extent based on my inaugural lecture on 30 of June 2023, where I accepted my chair on tax governance at Leiden University. In my inaugural lecture, I concluded that international taxation nowadays is not only about the technical rules. The political developments need to be taken into account in order to participate in the international tax lawmaking process and to introduce tax rules. Countries should not only have technical knowledge, but also resources and political will to change the rules. In light of the goals of this research network, I will be focusing on this speech on my path to research, my research questions, and some conclusions of the Globe Tax Gov ERC research project. With this, I hope I can motivate other scholars to find their own research path. Since February 2018, when I started my Globe Tax Gov project, I'm searching for the conditions under which a model of global tax governance can be feasible and legitimate, not only for developed, but also for developing countries. In order to do so, I have used the theories of international relations and political science to address global tax governance. To define global tax governance, I have used the definition given by 2016, in 2016 by Thomas Rickson and Peter Dish in their book, Global Tax Governance, what is wrong with it and how to fix it. They defined global tax governance as consisting of the set of the institutions governing issues of taxation that involve cross-border transactions or have other international implications. This definition implies that global tax governance need not, but could involve a full or partial shift of the power to tax, that is, the right to impose tax on citizens to the international level. 
As I will further elaborate below, since the 2018, the 2008 financial crisis, the OECD, with the political mandate of the G20, have introduced the standards. First, the standard of change of information, thereafter the BEPS project, and the BEPS for minimum standards to tackle tax avoidance by multinationals. More recently, the proposals to address taxation of highly digitalized business and to introduce a global minimum tax rate to tackle tax competition. These standards are applicable to G20, OECD, non-OECD, non-G20 countries, including developing countries. In my view, when addressing international, these international tax law developments from the perspective of global tax governance, using Thomas Rickson and Dish definition, it means that there is a chief of power to tax from countries to international organizations, the OECD and the G20. Before addressing the international and EU political developments that have brought us to discuss global tax governance, I will be addressing my path to research. So how did I get here? In short, my current research addresses global tax governance using comparative legal theory, political science and taxation. My interest in legal transplants and comparative law theory started while carrying out my PhD at the University of Groningen under the supervision of Professor Irene Burgers. In my PhD, I relied mainly on Watson's definition of legal transplants as the moving of a rule of a system of law from one country to another or from one people to another. In my PhD, I investigated how the concept of leasing was transplanted from the United States to France, the Netherlands and Colombia, and whether there were, rules different, there were different rules upon transplantation. For this purpose, I used comparative legal theories, such as Watson, Sacco, Nelken, among others, to understand why countries use legal transplants in taxation. Furthermore, I used legal culture theories to explain the reasons for the difference in the rules. I did this in four different branches of law, tax law, private law, accounting law, and banking law. In my view, legal rules can be borrowed by e countries either from an international organization or from one country to another. But the legal system and the legal culture may have an influence on the way that these rules change upon transplantations. Using the word of a comparative legal scholar, Oruku, legal culture provides the local fine tuning to explain why rules change upon transplantation. This PhD raised my interest to use legal transplants and legal culture in taxation. Following the 2008 financial crisis, I decided to study the introduction of the new standard at that time of a change of information. Since 2012, I'm also researching the content of the BEPS project and the feasibility of this project to tackle aggressive tax planning in developing countries. In my articles, I have argued that one size does not fit all, and that the standards of transparency, exchange of information, and the BEPS project should take into account the difference among countries, developed versus developing countries, among regions, Africa, with also sub-regions, Latin America, Central America, and Asia, as well as the difference in legal systems and legal cultures. In my view, more research is needed on how these standards operate within the country's legal systems, legal cultures, and geographical, region, and sub-regions contexts. I did some of this research in cooperation with other colleagues within the framework of the project Sustainable Tax Governance in Developing Countries through Global Transparency, DESTAT project funded by the Government of Norway. Following these articles and the DESTAT project, one question that I kept asking myself is, what is the validity of the standard of change of information and the BEPS action plan vis-a-vis -vis developing countries? But then, validity in terms of what? In order to answer this question, and in the midst of the discussions of the content of the BEPS project, I started with an article where I analyzed the validity and feasibility of the BEPS project vis-a-vis -vis developing countries. However, the validity was still a vague concept, so I researched in theories of political science to define legitimacy. I used SHARF and Smith's concept of input-output SHARF and throughput Schmidt legitimacy, which have been used in other areas than tax law. In short, legitimacy 
provides for a framework to evaluate the participation and representation in decision making, input legitimacy, the outcome being useful for all stakeholders, output legitimacy, and the process being transparent, inclusive, accountable, and open, throughput legitimacy. I have used these concepts when explaining the conditions for international tax law making from the OECD, G20, and the EU to be legitimate, validity, vis-a-vis -vis non OECD, non G20, non EU countries. By using the concept of legitimacy, I have been able to address some of the GLOVE tax code research questions. I have been also able to question the role of the OECD, G20, and the EU in international tax lawmaking, in conferences, seminars with different audiences, including academia, civil society, international organizations, among others. We have all of these publications, presentations available open science in our blog, Globe Tax Gov. I want to explain a little of the international political developments and the EU political developments. And thereafter, I will explain, I will address four specific questions that also refers to this title of this lecture, this keynote speech, from legitimacy to inclusiveness. However, since we have a tax audience, I will reduce and I will really provide a very short definition of a very short explanation of these developments. So, international political developments. Since the 2008 financial crisis, as we mentioned before, the OECD, with the political mandate of the G20, have introduced international tax standards, a change of information, and the BEPS project. The BEPS project includes four minimum standards, 10 best practices, and one multilateral instrument. The OECD say that they claim that they did so with the political mandate of the G20 and by inviting non-OECD, non-G20 countries to participate in these initiatives, develop and developing countries will benefit since a change of information and less tax avoidance will raise more revenue by countries. This revenue could be used for public services, health, education, etc., but also to contribute to fairness of taxation vis-a-vis -vis citizens who were suffering from the consequences of the financial crisis. In short, more money meant more money for countries to overcome the problems created by the financial crisis. In both cases, the result is the OECD, with the political mandate of the G20, introducing international tax standards that non-OECD, non-G20 countries are implementing through their membership networks or by signing multilateral instrument conventions. For instance, we have for the BEPS project, we have now 143 jurisdictions, tax jurisdictions, that are members of the BEPS inclusive framework, and we have also BEPS multilateral instruments signed by more than 100 jurisdictions. Countries participating in the Global Transparency Forum and the BEPS Inclusive Framework have also agreed to be reviewed by their peers, peer review, on their commitment to these standards. However, unlike treaties, where you sign the treaty and it has an effect for both or multiple parties, the BEPS for minimum standards are regarded as soft law, since these standards are not binding for countries. So in principle, countries are not required to implement these standards but they do so. Why? These questions have been addressed in several articles that we have published in the framework of the Globe Tax Gov project, and we are also working on a forthcoming article on a case study of the peer review. Due to the also the increase of digital business, and also we have now the discussion on the Pillar 1 and the Pillar 2, and this Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, since in 2021, 137 of the 141 countries of the BEPS Inclusive Framework reach out a political agreement. I will discuss this Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 a little, a little later on. The legitimacy of all of these political developments by the OECD, G20, and the BEPS Inclusive Framework has been and it still is questioned by scholars, civil society, countries, regional tax organizations, and regional organizations in general. These questions of feasibility and legitimacy are even more relevant now. In the midst of the discussions taking place since November 2022 yeah. at the United Nations level, these discussions have been initiated by Nigeria with the support of some African countries. 
This country submitted a proposal for a draft resolution at the UN Second Committee on the promotion of inclusive and effective international tax cooperation at the United Nations. This resolution has been approved by the General Assembly in December 2022. But this is not the first time that efforts have been made to give the role of an important role to the United Nations. We also have in the 2015 Addis Ababa conference, where also was proposed by some developing countries, civil society, to give an intergovernmental role to the UN Tax Committee. At that time, in 2015, 2015 the OECD and also some developing countries say, we have and we acknowledge the role, the predominant role, an important role of the OECD in international tax matters. However, things have changed. As I mentioned before, we now are talking about a UN resolution, was adopted last year in 2022, and now a, a report that has been just published uh, last month. Given the political developments and the voice raised by scholars, civil society and countries unilateral or in regional setting, this new development at the United Nations could shift the decision-making process from the OECD G20 towards the United Nations. But of course, we will have to wait and see. Since my inaugural lecture, two developments have taken place, which also illustrate the political dimension of international tax lawmaking. In July 2023, 138 of the 143 jurisdictions have committed to the standstill freeze of digital taxes, while global, global agreement is being reached and have been agree, have agreed on the implementation of the uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. But there have been some changes between the political statement of 2021 and the political statement of 2023. In the political statement of 2021, Nigeria, Kenya, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan decided not to participate and not to endorse this political statement. But now, in this 2023 political statement, so July, two months ago, it is Canada, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Russia, and Belarus. And it is not clear why this has changed, except for it, Canada says, well, we are not going to commit to a standstill of the digital freezing of the digital taxes until we do not know if rich, uh, global agreement will be reached. We know Russia and Belarus has to do perhaps with the Ukrainian war. But if you see, there are two countries, Nigeria and Kenya. They changed their position. Why? So Kenya and Nigeria, they supported the 2023 political statement, but they did not support the, 2001, the 2021 political statement. At that time, 2021, Nigeria expressed that the political outcome was not fair, and therefore they decided to continue with their own rules, significant economic presence. Kenya has a digital service tax, so at that moment it was not considered by policymakers in Kenya that the country should commit to this political statement. However, in the framework of the negotiations of a trade agreement, the US has asked Kenya to repeal the digital service tax and to commit to the political outcome of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Kenya's government has recently expressed that they will follow the path. The reason why Nigeria has changed the position is not clear, since Nigeria is also one of the initiators of the UN tax resolution. In August 23, the final version of the report to promote inclusive and international tax cooperation at the United Nations was published, actually last week. In addition to a set of three proposals, the report addresses the need to make changes in international tax lawmaking. The report states, and it was emphasized in many inputs and the consultations, that inclusiveness and effectiveness in international tax cooperation must also be evaluated in terms of the processes by which international tax norms are developed and followed through. The key aspects that emerged were participation, agenda setting, decision making, and implementation, including 
the monitoring, avoidance and resolution of tax disputes. The UN final report states that inclusive and effective international tax cooperation requires legally established and transparent decision making. Such as the rules are clear and not adapted to suit, suit the interests of those on one side of the debate or another. Having transparent rules helps to ensure that all participants are on equal footing procedurally and have the same ability to engage meaningful in decision making, whether through consensus-based or voting-based process or a combination of the two. In my view, and as I have argued last week at the African Tax Research Network conference in Tanzania, in the panel seizing the opportunity Africa's path to harnessing and profit, profit from global tax reforms, both the OECD and the UN should give attention to the way that the decision-making process is legitimate and inclusive for both developed and developing countries. As I have discussed in my inaugural lecture, and I discuss it here, the agenda setting and decision-making should be transparent. The body, either the OECD or the UN, should be accountable for the decisions taken. The process should be open to all stakeholders and responsive to the needs of all countries. The role of regional organizations is important. And for Africa, in this case, the role of the African Tax Administration Forum, but also the political will is important. And in this case, for instance, in Africa, the African Union has an important role to play. Next to these international political developments, we also have the AU political developments. At European Union level, and with the aim to play a more important role in the international tax developments vis-a-vis -vis non AU countries, the AU Commission has introduced in 2008 this AU standard of tax good governance that provided for transparency, exchange of information, and fair tax competition. Since 2018, this standard also includes commitment to the BEPS for minimum standards. This standard of tax good governance is introduced in economic trade partnership agreements with third non-European countries, as well as one of the preconditions to receive AU8 and to be excluded from the blacklist of non-cooperative jurisdictions. In light of the above, my research in the Globe Tax Gov project and my current chair investigates, in addition to the role of the OECD and the G20, under what conditions can the role of the European Union in international tax law making be legitimate and feasible vis-a-vis non-OECD, non-EU, non-G20 countries, including developing countries. In 2021, I was awarded an AU Jamonet chair to raise awareness of the use of the standard of EU tax code governance and the consequences for non-EU countries, including developing countries. Receiving this Jamonet chair shows that research can be translated into teaching, and the courses I'm teaching now at Leiden Law School also contribute to raise the awareness of this standard. But let's talk about the topic of this keynote speech from legitimacy to inclusiveness, why it matters. From legitimacy, scholars, civil society, and countries have expressed in articles and meetings at international and regional level their concerns regarding the legitimacy of the BEPS project vis-a-vis -vis non OECD non-G20 countries. Scholars and countries in regional consultations have also addressed issues outside the BEPS project that are relevant for developing countries, such as taxation of the informal economy, taxation of capital gains from indirect transfers, among others. Some of these topics are being also discussed and addressed by international organizations, such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Platform for Collaboration on Tax. In order to address these concerns, the OECD created the BEPS Inclusive Framework, where countries were invited to participate as BEPS associates and to commit to the implementation of the BEPS for minimum standards. This implementation is on equal footing and on the consensus minus one rule. This rule means that upon review of the implementation, the peer review of the country can be adopted even if one country does not agree with it. Minus one rule. 
This country can be most likely be the country which is being peer reviewed. The system of peer review and consensus minus one rule was adopted based on the experience of the peer review of the change of information. <laughs> At that time, Uruguay, a country with bank secrecy, opposed it to the peer review report, but the report was adopted based on this rule, consensus minus one rule. To inclusiveness. In addition to legitimacy, there are other concerns from developing countries, including the fast pace of the BEPS project and the lack of resources, personal, financial, to participate effectively at the discussions at the OECD, either in Paris or online. Furthermore, some scholars, civil society, and think tanks have highlighted that the main role in international tax policy making should be given to the United Nations. These concerns have not been addressed with the creation of the BEPS inclusive framework, since for the BEPS project, the participation is on equal footing, but only for the purpose of the implementation of the BEPS for minimum standards. Furthermore, it is not clear that all countries can become members of the BEPS inclusive framework, since it needs approval of all of the other countries participating in this framework. This is the case of Cyprus that has not been able to join the BEPS inclusive framework to still show their commitment, its commitment to the BEPS project. Cyprus has decided to sign the BEPS multilateral instrument. Furthermore, at the start of the discussions between 2018-2019 of Pillar 1, taxation of highly digitalized business, it was clear that there were three positions, one from the OECD, one from the US, and one from the G24 countries that were developing countries. Because no consensus was reached, the OECD Secretariat submitted a proposal at the end of 2019, which was a combination of the OECD and the United States proposal, leaving behind the G24 developing countries proposal. Can you let me know when I have five minutes for the thing? Okay. In the midst of these discussions, the United States asked countries to refrain from introducing unilateral measures such as digital service tax, and if not, the U.S. will start Section 301 U.S. trade investigations, which will result in trade retaliation. In 2020, consultations and discussion took place, but without any progress on the adoption of the OECD Secretariat proposal. However, the situation changed in 2021 with the United States Biden's presidency. The United States decided to go forward with implementation of the GLOVE Pillar 2 proposal and to endorse the Pillar 1 OECD Secretariat proposal. This proposal was discussed at the G7, G20, and thereafter in the BEPS inclusive framework. The result is the political statement that I mentioned in 2020, from 2021 and the subsequent political statement in 2023. However, as I have explained before, not all countries have endorsed this political statement. And even between 2021 and 2023, countries have also changed their position. The case of Canada, Nigeria, and Kenya. So I want to finalize and conclude with four questions. And I want to answer to these questions in what I think is my view, but also to invite you to do more research on this. So my first question is, if the decision making took place at the OECD level with the political mandate of the G20, have non-OECD, non-G20 countries truly participate in the decision making process? As I have addressed it above in the previous discussion, the decision making of the content of the BEPS project and its 15 actions was made by the OECD with the political mandate of the G20. In my research, I have addressed that for OECD countries, the BEPS project was an opportunity to advance in projects that were not broadly implemented, for instance, harmful tax competition, and to take the leading role in international tax matters with the OECD Secretariat and the Committee of Fiscal Affairs deciding on the agenda topics to be addressed in the BEPS project. Even if countries wanted to participate in this decision-making process, it was not possible. 
as I argued in 2015, membership to the OECD is an invitation only. And this is even more difficult for the G20 since it's a political forum. Furthermore, as I mentioned, in respect of the proposal for Pillar 1 to tax highly digitalized business, G20 countries, remember this discussion of three proposals, the OECD, the US, and the G24 uh, countries, who were choosing for significant and economic presence, this proposal of G24 countries was left behind. And the OECD secretariat proposal took the OECD, took the US, and submitted the proposal. Nevertheless, the significant economic presence has been adopted unilaterally by countries such as Nigeria, Israel, and also Indonesia, G20 country, and in 2022, Colombia, OECD country. This shows that countries have decided to follow unilateral the rules that they consider are more convenient for their own economy. This is the case of the significant economic presence in the countries I mentioned, but also of the digital service tax in Kenya for taxation of highly digitalized business. If not, the second question, if not, is the creation of networks such as Global Transparency Forum and BEPS Inclusive Framework enough to justify the legitimacy of the decision-making process? Regional tax organizations, the African Tax Administration Forum, and countries in the Caribbean, Latin American, and Central American region have stated the fast pace of the implementation of the BEPS project and the need to provide equitable, effective, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 rules. Regarding the BEPS projects, some countries even decided to choose other standards that are not the minimum standards, so for instance, best practices. But this decision has been made unilaterally by each country. However, even if the countries have chosen to implement the BEPS minimum standards and some of the best practices, analysis of the peer review reports that I have been carried out shows that some countries may choose to do that in paper, but not in practice. Regarding the decision-making process, the discussion of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 within this impact inclusive framework have also shown that there is a limited participation of non-OECD, non-G20 countries in decision-making. This limited participation was also addressed by the OECD in the report to the G20 under the 2021 Italian presidency. In this report, the OECD stated that feedback from regional consultation events on practical ways to enhance inclusivity, inclusivity indicated a strong support for greater representation by developing countries in the leadership of the inclusive framework and its subsidiary bodies. In light of the above, the OECD has decided to create a co-chair. So in addition to a chair of the OECD country, they also have a co-chair from a non-OECD, non-G20 country. In this case, the co-chair is Marlene Parker from Jamaica. But the question is whether the proposed co-chair will be enough to ensure inclusive participation of developing countries in the decision-making process. We will have to wait and see, but the AU UN development shows that actually this is not the case. In addition, in the January 23 meeting of the World Economic Forum, Campo, the Minister of Finance of Colombia at that time, called Latin American and Caribbean ministers to rethink global taxation. For Ocampo, the two-pillar solution delivered by the OECD G20 inclusive framework is a stay forward, but that's not fully address the concern developing and emerging countries have raised. Latin American and Caribbean countries face common challenges when it comes to cross-border taxation, from the role of tax havens to taxing the highly digitalized economy. We share the same problem, say Ocampo, but we have not shared our views and technical strengths to come up with common solutions. Therefore, Ocampo says, our interests have not been visible enough in the international tax policy debate so far, and this must change. Following 
they organized a May conference. They also organized in July 2023, so two months ago, the first Latin American and Caribbean summit for an inclusive, sustainable, and equitable global tax order. In this conference, in this summit, finance ministers and high-level officials from 16 of the Latin American and Caribbean countries have approved the creation of a regional tax cooperation platform for Latin American and the Caribbean. This agreement has been supported by the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, known as ECLAC, which will act as the technical secretariat. To sum up, the description shows that countries in Africa, Central America, the Caribbean, and Latin America are questioning the legitimacy, feasibility, and inclusiveness of the initiatives to achieve international tax cooperation, as developed by the OECD and the G20, and are also questioning the need to establish a fair global tax order. In addition, countries such as Colombia, under the auspices of the United Nations, ECLAC, are proposing a new recuperation framework in Latin America and the Caribbean to address the needs of the region and to agree among common solutions tailored to the region. My third question. If the BEPS four minimum standards are regarded as soft law, thus non-binding, why countries are complying with these standards? By using theories of legal transplants, I have been able to explain some of the reasons why countries are complying with the BEPS for minimum standard. Some of the reasons I would like to highlight it here, and the first one is chance and necessity. The, due to the technical assistance by developed countries and our OECD and the twining projects between developed and developing countries. The second reason is the expected efficacy of the law the access to information by tax administrations and multinationals. The third reason may be political, economical, and reputational incentives. The commitment to the AU standard of tax good governance in trade partnership agreements to receive AU funding and to be excluded of the list of non-cooperative jurisdictions. I have addressed the use of legal transplants in several articles. But I'm also now looking at the peer review, and I'm looking at the peer review of countries that are members of the BEPS inclusive framework who have committed to the implementation of the best for minimum standards. And what I have mentioned before that in, actually they may commit to the standards in theory, but not in practice, is currently being uh, researched and it will come in a forthcoming article. And then I have my fourth question and final. Despite the work done by the OECD and the G20 in the BEPS project and Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, should the decision making take place at the OECD level or rather at the United Nations level? And if so, how? In my view, this is the most difficult question to answer at this stage. Since the United Nations development is recent, since November 2022. But it's also difficult because of the changes in the OECD secretariat. And you will see tomorrow the, another keynote speak, uh, speaker. And one of the things is that when we started, and when Pascal Santamans was the director at the OECD Center for Tax Policy and Administration, the BEPS project, the BEPS action, the proposal for Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 were developed and discussed, including also the political uh, outcome. There was a clear movement of the OECD towards inviting countries to participate as best associate in the BEPS inclusive framework, as well as to commit to the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals. Since then, the OECD has focused on the design of Pillar 2 rules, model rules, safe harbor, technical administrative guidance, as well as to address issues such as compliance and tax, compliance and tax certainty. In respect of Pillar 1, taxation of highly digitalized business, the OECD is still in the process of having public consultations and in the design of amount A and B. During that time, as we have addressed before, countries, civil society, and some regional tax organizations, ATAF, call for a more decisive role of the United Nations. One of the main reasons is the broader representation of countries in the United Nations vis-a-vis -vis the limited membership of the OECD countries. I have also argued that participation of the 
G20 is even more difficult because it's a political forum. So you cannot even be there. And why G20, G24 countries of G77 were not invited, who are, have a, a more developing countries, is not clear. In addition to that, the UN has also developed their own rules, for instance, Article 12b, to deal with the taxation of automatic digital services. However, times have changed as Nigeria, with the support of some African countries and Colombia, currently an OECD member country, that took part in the BEPS decision-making process as OECD accession country at that time, have questioned whether there is a global fair tax deal that benefits not only developed, but developing countries. I am still skeptical of the role of the UN. And in my view, for the UN to have a leading role, there should be a coordination between all units, UNDESA, UNDP, UN Tax Committee, but this requires also political will of countries and of the UN institutions. For any international tax body to function, either as the UN or as a separate international tax body, it is important to keep in mind that it's not only about the input and output legitimacy, but also about throughput legitimacy, accountability, openness, transparency, inclusiveness. From observing the process that it has been carried out since November 2022, in my view, the UN and its institutions, mainly UNDESA, could be more open and responsive. Since, since at this moment, despite the public consultations, one closed for all, uh, for the countries, and another one open for stakeholders, and the publication of documents in the UN website, there is no clarity who is hiring the experts to present work tests on the multilateral instrument, multilateral convention, multilateral framework. And also the question is, are countries still truly participating? And now we have this report that will be discussed at the UN, uh, presented by the UN Secretary <coughs> General. But who is going to discuss this report? Is the technical people from the Minister of Finance, of the Tax Administration, or is the UN ambassadors? So again, technical, political. And we will still need political will. The choice for one of the options, they have a convention, and they have a framework convention, and they have a framework will be need to be carefully assessed by the countries. If we talk about a multilateral convention, we know that it takes time to negotiate, to ratify. If we talk about a con framework convention, what will be there? And if we talk about a framework, what do we do with it? And in addition to that, we also see that regional tax organizations and also regional organizations will need to play a role on this. And this is also the case, for instance, in the recent created regional tax cooperation platform for Latin America and the Caribbean. So what is next? In 2017, I received a starting grant from the European Research Council to carry out global tax governance, to investigate the conditions under which this model of global tax governance will be legitimate and feasible for both developed and developing countries. I started this project at Leiden University. When I started to discuss global tax governance, the BEPS project just started. Five years later, we also have Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, as well as the recent developments at the UN level. Moreover, on the 15th of June of this year, the AU Parliament, in a resolution on lessons learned from the Pandora Papers, called for the AU to support the setting up of a UN framework on tax with the aim of strengthening international cooperation and governance on tax and trade-related illicit financial flows. The AU also highlights the need to introduce transparent and inclusive decision-making where all countries can negotiate as equal. But in light of the AU standard of tax good governance that I have mentioned before, my question is, is this really true? Can developing countries negotiate as equals? Since non-EU countries, including developing countries, are required to implement BEPS and receive a positive review. Following up the questions addressed in the Globe Tax Code Research Project that just finished 31st of July, I will continue addressing these questions also in my chair on tax governance and in my Yamone chair, 
and I also aim to expand this research agenda to look at the UN, the role of the UN. Since we are in this research network, I want to highlight something that I say in my inaugural lecture. This task is not one person task, but a multiple stakeholder task. Therefore, cooperation, a change of knowledge, experience, sharing publications, presentations via open access is relevant. Coming from Colombia, an emerging country that only recently joined the OECD, I also want to focus on what the changes mean on international tax lawmakers for the global south, for developing countries. To conclude, international taxation nowadays, as I mentioned before, is not only about the technical rules. The political developments need to be taken into account. What I have learned since 2018, when I started with my Globe Tax Gov project, is that the questions of legitimacy, inclusiveness continue being relevant for all stakeholders and that any process of international tax lawmaking will need to analyze the conditions under which this process can be legitimate and feasible for developed and developing countries. This is true in the BEPS project, but also in the current developments of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 and the UN tax resolution. We cannot forget the process, so therefore more attention should be given to transparency, accountability, responsiveness and openness. Thank you.